one in. So we'll do some intros and stuff. Um, but first of all, I just wanted to thank everybody for taking the time out of their evening and signing on to this. Um, hopefully, well, I know there's gonna be a lot of great information shared tonight. Um, application seasons are kicking off or already in full swing, depending on which states you're interested in. And um, we at Onyx have been working with Hunt and Fool for several years, um, close to a decade, if I'm not mistaken, well before my time at Onyx. But um, as of recently, we last year uh, worked out a deal with Hunt and Fool that if you are an Onyx Elite member, you now have free access to their digital membership. So super exciting um, additional benefit for the Onyx Elite folks. Um, and yeah, we're, we're excited tonight to have them on and, and kind of headline this one and talk about all things application season. So they are going to run through a, a presentation just for kind of the, the basics for application season, things you need to know. Um, and then we'll also do um, quite a bit of, of Q&A. Um, so feel free to go down to the, the Q&A section and ans ask your questions. Um, we'll have folks also uh, typing responses online if we don't get to you. And then uh, we will get to you at some point, whether we can get to you uh, live here or through the comments section. So just so you know that. Um, so to kick it off, I'll do a, uh, an intro of myself and then hand it over to the Hunt and Pool crew. Uh, my name is Dylan Dowson. Um, I do marketing for Onyx for all Western big game related things. Um, I've been with Onyx for about six and a half years. Um, hunting's always been a passion of mine, whether whether or not, you know, I worked for a hunting company like Onyx. Um, you know, I grew up hunting and it's it's definitely a lifestyle passion of mine. So pretty cool to, to be able to work at Onyx and get to know and, and work with uh, the folks at Hunt and Fool. Um, and so, yeah, I, I briefly touched on the, the partnership too. Uh, for those of, of you who are just logging in now, again, as part of the Onyx Elite membership, you have free access to the digital membership at Huntful. So we will um, definitely walk through A, how to redeem that, share the link in the comments, and then B, kind of what that digital membership entails throughout. So um, I will kick it over to the guys at Huntful to do some individual intros and then just talk briefly about Huntful as a company, uh, when they were founded, what, what Huntful really encompasses, and we will get this thing rolling. You want to take us off? You can do it. All right. <clears throat> well, first of all, thanks everybody for joining us. We're going to talk about some exciting things today, but we're also going to talk about some depressing things like point creep and other things like that. We had a great round of initial questions that came in. You can tell there's a lot of people out there that are really studying Western big game and how to get more hunting opportunities. And that's what Hunt and Fool is all about. Um, to summarize what we do, we basically try to get all of our members and clients on more hunts and arm them with the best information they can have. So they have the best hunt out there. It can be gear, it can be uh, unit selection, where to burn your points, all of those kind of things. Hunt and Fool has been around uh, for 25 years and uh, 25 years ago, most of the point systems weren't very mature, and so it was a great time to start. It can be a little more daunting at this point in time, as I'm sure many of the people on this uh, webinar already know. But nonetheless, we still find ways to get in the woods every single year on zero to no point tags. We do not waste any time getting in, in the woods as often as possible, and that's kind of one of our goals is hopefully to empower everybody here to hunt more uh, we don't like accumulating points as much as we like accumulating memories. So that's what we're going to talk about a lot today. My name's Jared Lyle. Um, I've been with Hunt and Fool for about six years now. Uh, I've been a Hunt and Fool member for over 20. Uh, it's something I believed in from a long, long time ago because I could see the, the handwriting on the wall. And it was a great tool for busy people who are trying to understand draw systems for 20 plus states that we break down on your behalf. So that's kind of an overview uh, for me, Garth. So I'm Garth Jensen. I've been with Hunt and Fool now for about seven years. Um, I've been a longtime member. I didn't really get into it because I could see the writing on the wall. <laughs> I just got into it because I know I wanted to hunt other places other than my home state of Utah. So it helped me do that. And it's honestly taken me to a lot of different areas and different places that I otherwise would not have ever have known about. So 
yeah, that's me in a nutshell. And that's my history with hunting fool, but I've been applying out of state now for 20 plus years. I'm Robert Hanneman. I've been with the Hunt and Fool for 10 years and uh, became a member back in 2001. So I've been a member for a long time. And even prior to that, in high school, one of my uh, best friend's dads was one of the original members from Hunt and Fool. So I grew up in Nevada, realized that John Tags was tough, started applying everywhere. And uh, it just kind of snowballed from there to where I am today. But you know, just like these guys, I try to hunt as much as I can and fill my schedule from August till December because with a great CEO, if you're on a hunt, you don't have to be at work. <laughs> There's some truth to that. A little the, bit. The, the not being at work part, not the great CEO part. Uh, yeah, and these two both won't say it, but they are a key part of the backbone of the entire company. Um, they know they have forgotten more than I will probably ever know when it comes to writing state sections, et cetera. We'll talk through that a little bit. Collectively, we produce about 1,500 pages of content a year of hunt research that's dedicated, again, to getting you out in the field, whether it be inspiring you through member stories or whether it be inspiring you to take a chance, burn some points, uh, go on an OTC tag, you name it. So the two of these guys take thousands of calls a year, uh, it's part of our all access membership. <clears throat> Again, uh, all elite members, uh, you guys have been granted a digital membership, which means you can read all of that content online. Uh, you can access our member draw database that has over 26,000 people who have hunted good tags like the ones you're chasing before. And when you draw those tags, you can call Hunt and Fool or email us and we'll send you a list of people who have boots on the ground experience. We've got proprietary draw odds that help you really understand how to acquire tags and what your real chances are. Some of them are a little depressing, admittedly, yeah. but some of them are exciting. So anyway, that's kind of an overview of Hunt and Fool. We'd like to dive in, go through a fairly quick presentation uh, that kind of outlines, uh, I think it'll maybe inspire some questions. And then we're going to have a, uh, hopefully a robust Q&A at the end of this thing. So you can ask any questions you want. Yeah, and I'll, I'm going to interject here real quick as you guys uh, get the presentation queued up. I've personally been on a many phone calls, and a couple of us, uh, the Hunt Fool guys here, sitting here have shared some road trips together, and just, yeah, I have not, I have not met anybody in the industry as knowledgeable as the whole Hunt Fool folks as far as state research, unit research. Um, not only is it knowledge, but 99% of the time, the person you're talking to, or they, they know somebody there who has been there and actually hunted that unit. So it's not just, Hey, you know, this, here's your draw odds. Here's, you know, kind of a brief overview of the unit. It's like, I have first hand knowledge of hunting that unit. Um, and that's where it's pretty cool. As Robert said there of, they, they spend a ton of time out in the field. So, um, you know, when you're talking to those guys or reading the magazine, like there's a lot of in-person, in-the-field knowledge about those units. And it's not just, you know, looking at um, this statistic or that statistic as this percent public land. All that is super valuable information. But on top of that, talking to somebody and reading information about somebody who's actually been there is invaluable. So just wanted to interject that. Um, and, you know, these three folks on the call are, are the three right now, but there's a lot more behind the scenes. So um, yeah, we, we can kick off the presentation whenever you guys are ready. Okay, we'll dive right in. <clears throat> and again, there's going to be some basic information that some of you on the call will certainly already know, but we also have some tips and tricks uh, somewhere hidden in the presentation that will probably be interesting and unique uh, that you may not have heard before, so stay tuned. Uh, we'll dive past that slide. You've already met us. Now, <clears throat> you might want to know for... Oh, oh yeah. folks, we got a guy right in the bottom right hand corner named Austin Atkinson. He is on the computer right now. And if you see something, some, you know, he's answering a lot of questions as it goes along. So that is one of the major keys of this whole thing. <laughs> Absolutely. He's got the fastest fingers uh, in the West when it comes to the keyboard. So, and the trigger, we call him the Grim Reaper here in the office. <laughs> he wastes no time uh, filling freezers every fall. So yeah, Austin will be answering your uh, chat questions. And again, just to make sure, uh, Dylan, we're not, those questions aren't coming through the chat. They need to come through the Q&A, right, in order to be successfully queued up. Yep, yep, correct. The uh, Q&A section at the bottom is, is the best place to get those asked. Perfect. All right. With that, we're going to dive in. Robert was going to go through some of the common questions we field at the Hunt and Fool office. So I'm not going to read each one of these, but we get lots and lots of questions that are the same, and that could be 
am I too old to start applying? Am I, you know, not ever going to draw a sheep tag? You know, what kind of boots should I wear? I'm looking for a backpack. We cover everything, you know, on the one-on-one -on -one membership where you can call us and ask us about gear. You can ask us about, um, you know, any different state on over-the-counter tags. You know, one cool thing that you guys are going to be part of on the digital membership is our July and August magazines are all over-the-counter, you know, states covered. So everyone's always so afraid, like, if I don't draw a tag, I won't go hunting. Well, in reality, there's more over-the-counter opportunity than I can hunt in one year. Like, I could fill my whole schedule with over-the-counter opportunity. So any kind of question that you can think of, can I afford this hunt? Should I play the raffle? You know, should I put my kids in for tags? You know, I'm a huge fan of putting kids in for tags, mainly because I got three boys that are, you know, drawing lots of good youth <laughs> tags. So pretty much if there's any question that you can think of, we've probably already seen it between me and Garth and the other guys, we take thousands of phone calls a year. Um, you know, so, and when those calls do come in, you know, they go to the person who's the most knowledgeable about that, you know, unit or, you know, boots or whatever it is. So like I said, all kinds of questions, don't be afraid. If you do become a one-on-one -on -one member, there's no stupid questions. We've heard them all and we're here to help you. And I mean, it's, it's priceless to have that one-on-one -on -one interaction where Dylan can pick up the phone and say, Hey, Robert, my buddy drew a moose tag and, you know, Miller Creek this year, help me please. Yeah. And that hopefully inspires you too. any question here is not off limits and there's literally none on the entire seminar. Um, real quick, this is going to be high level and maybe seem a little bit basic for some on the call, but <clears throat> we're going to talk about the difference between the draws. Uh, the states do this, and then a ton of uh, clients and customers do this, where they kind of co-mingle terms that don't necessarily mean the same thing. So we're going to carefully define what the difference is between random draws, bonus point draws, preference point draws, and blended draws. We're trying to do that as quick as possible, but it's super important to understand the distinction, just because if you don't, you can get caught up chasing dead-end draws that you don't even realize you don't have a chance at. And it's it, on that note, I mean, there is, it, it can be tricky even in certain states to disseminate blended draws versus preference draws because a lot of times they'll have both within the same state. Yeah. So, yeah. We're trying to go through that. So. Well, I'm a huge fan of random draws. Um, you know, if you're young, just coming up, you're 18, 19, 20, most of these point systems are 20, 25, 30 years mature, you know, so those random tags can be better for you. So like Alaska, Idaho, and New Mexico, there's absolutely no point system. Everyone's equal every single year. So I'm a huge fan of those. Get your name in the hat, you know, like when it comes to a sheep or anything else, a lot of these states that are the blended or the preference, most or all of the tags are going to the guys with the most points. Well, unless you're old, you're probably not in that point category. So I'm a huge fan of those. In some other states like Colorado, Oregon, Montana, and Wyoming, they have certain species that are in a random draw. Like Wyoming, you're going to have the mountain goat and the bison. Montana, you're going to have the bison. Oregon, it's going to be the goat and the sheep. Colorado is, what is it? Garth? Desert. 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 Desert sheep. Yeah. I always forget about that because there's one tag and I put in for Rockies. But so there's lots of options out there where you're equal to everyone, including someone who's been applying for 30 years. So I'm a huge fan of random draws. You know, there's also the bonus point draws. Um, those are your Montana, Colorado, you know, Nevada, Washington. Those can be squared systems where your points are squared and gives you more chances in the in the hat. You know, um, you know, some of those like with Colorado, they're weighted point systems, you know, and then so those are just different options that, you know, again, they're random. And that kid with one tag could draw when I might have 300 names in the hat. So there's still a chance. It's still kind of a random tag. Every tag is going to go random, but it's more weighted to the guys with points. And then there's the true preference point states uh -huh. like Oregon for your deer, elk, and antelope, Iowa for their deer, and Colorado deer, elk, and antelope. And those are whoever has the most points gets the tag. That's all there is to it. So if someone puts in with more points, they're going to get the tag before you get it. So that's kind of a rundown on that. Then you get into the blended draws, and because that's you know Gar's forte, yeah. over him. Well, Before you dive in on that, that's one common mistake we have a lot of newer members uh, do is they'll say, "Well, I'm trying to draw a really tough deer or elk tag in Colorado," and that and like Robert said, if you don't have enough points, they wad your application up, throw it in the fire, and burn it. Like literally, you're donating your money. So you need to understand in a true preference yeah. point draw, if you do not have enough points, you're not in the draw at all. And, and one, one thing I'll touch on Colorado quick, we get a call every once in a while because they have a, what they call a hybrid draw where they'll see it in the proclamation. They'll be like, Hey, you know, I see we have a hybrid draw for X number of units or zones for 
this hunt code basically that's for residents there's there's no non-resident tags remaining except for possibly an antelope tag every once in a while that runs through there so but everything else is all pure preference and we can say the exact same thing about oregon 75 percent go to the guys with the most points 25 percent go random but in reality for deer and elk we truly get two and a half percent of the tags because the other two and a half go to outfitters so when two and a half percent of the tags none of them ever make it to random so like gar said if it does happen lightning struck but for the most part think of those states as true preference point states yeah it's just that's just kind of a a little bit of a window as to how each one of these states are a little bit tricky and then i'll touch on these blended draws and confuse you even even more <laughs> or hopefully i'll be able to at least under you'll be able to understand what they are so in arizona when you get looking at that basically 80 percent of the tags go in the random draw and 20 percent go in the preference now it gets a little tricky in the in the non-resident pool because up to 50 percent of those can be issued in up to 50 percent of the non-resident quota can be issued in that preference draw and the rest of that non-resident quota can be issued in the random but basically the people with the top amount of points get those 20 percent and then after that it kicks everyone else that did not draw in that preference draw in a random draw but in arizona what's nice is you do get extra chances for the amount of points you build up so in that random draw you do they, they act as a bonus count. point yeah so in california 90 percent um, preference 10 percent random that's where it's a little bit tough it's tricky it's hard to draw um that's why well it, it, it's going to be hard anyways, regardless, because non-resident quotas are so short in California. Well, there's up to two sheep tags, one elk tag. Yeah, a one animal. One animal tag. Yeah. In the whole state for non-residents. Yeah. So it's a difficult one. I hate even mentioning it, but it's in there. Real um, generous. <laughs> <laughs> the generosity never yes. stops. Um, Utah, when it comes to them, it's a 50-50 split as far as how many tags are issued in, and this, and we'll, I'll say this, it's a blended preference slash bonus. So I'm talking about the limited entry tags. The limited entry draw in Utah, 50-50. You get 50% of those tags that are issued to the top point pool and 50% are issued in the random draw. It acts as Arizona. So you actually do get extra chances for the amount of points you build up in the random draw. Where it becomes a little tricky is if there's an odd number of tags available, that odd number or that one-off tag will go in the preference draw. So that will be awarded in the max point draw. And then, so there'll be fewer tags in the random draw. That's where it gets split. The other portion of Utah, and this is where it's a little bit tricky, is they have a general deer tag as well. The general deer tag is a true preference only. And I guess they have preference only in others, like uh, in antlerless draws, things mm -hmm. like that. But that's a true preference draw. If you don't have the number of points to get in there, then you won't draw. They don't have any random tags available on that one. Um, in Wyoming, it's, it's a 75 preference, 25% random. Um, and contrary to Utah and Arizona, once you hit that random draw, it is one chance and one chance only. Any points you've accumulated up to that are only preference points. They do not act as bonus points in the random draw. So that's where it gets a little bit tricky, but they cycle through guys fairly, fairly quickly in Wyoming makes it a little bit good for that. Right. This right. is a lot of high point guys a bit taken out of that with a 75%. Percent. Now he said cycle through fairly fast. We're 16 years in and we still have a thousand guys with max elk points. That's because <laughs> they're all going for the same same, yeah, same during that units. time, I drew three Wyoming elk tags. I've drawn yeah, four. four in the pre yeah, five. Yeah, five. <laughs> and that's our point. Like, don't be a point collector necessarily. I mean, if you're going don't trophy, be only, a point collector. oh, yeah, here we go for <laughs> mule deer guilty. Um, yeah, and then we'll talk briefly about just for kind of classification so you understand our terminology at hunt pool. We use the term opportunity hunts a lot. The other common term is, of course, over the counter or OTC tags, and we saw a lot of those in the questions leading up to this. So we they're kind of one and the same in many ways for us, but basically opportunity hunts, we define as things that you can either go on every year or uh, without having a long point haul to get there. Um, and then, of course, landowner tags are simply a way that the states compensate private landowners for public wildlife usage on their property crop damage, fence damage, you name it. They, they issue these landowner tags. It's a way to bypass the draw. The price on landowner tags the last few years has gone 
absolutely through the roof. It's unbelievable how expensive they are, but it is a way if you have the budget to bypass the draw and get quality tags uh, in, or, in an effort to compensate landowners for private uh, private land. And then raffle tags, I don't play, but you said I, you I love raffle tags. Um, you know, I I probably spend in the neighborhood uh, three to $400 a year on raffle tags and every single state has some raffle tags and they're going to run anywhere between $5 and $25. So like, I don't, you know, put, you could put $10,000 in the raffle if you wanted to. I'm the kind of guy where I just want my name in the hat once. So Montana offers a super tag for all their species, $5 a piece. Wyoming's are $10 with the trifecta of the light pick three, you know, but every single state has a raffle and, you know, it's just another way to get your name in the hat. And, you know, sometimes like we talk about Colorado, you know, and it could be 20 years to draw that great tag. Well, if I draw the raffle, the raffle is typically like a governor's tag. It may not give you extended dates. Some states it does, some states it doesn't, but it'll let you to hunt any unit in the state that's typically open. So everything from California, Washington, Oregon, Arizona, New Mexico, I mean, there is a pile of raffle tags. And I believe somewhere on our website, we might have a under maybe license app where it details yeah. all of our license or raffle tags. But again, you could drop a ton of money. I'm that guy that I want my name in the hat one time every time. So I probably spend the neighborhood of three to 400 bucks here. I, I always forget because it's always typically it's all those raffle tags draw, are later separate yes. they're yeah. later in the season after most of the draws <laughs> and my mind has already shifted focus at that point. And so I forget to put in, but there is some pretty good opportunities because well, you have eight other tags in your pocket already <laughs> planning for. And one of my boys drew a <clears throat> raffle tag last year. So, I mean, I put my kids in too and he hit a $5 tag and won a phenomenal tag. Yeah. So there, everybody, I mean, it's again. Yeah, but your kids are extraordinarily lucky. I don't know what you're doing, but either. or well, what they're doing right, but it's something. And they're from Montana. If you're playing the WHCE game, if you're from Montana and you attend the Western Hunting Expo, by all means put in, because typically that's where they come from. <laughs> yeah, That's where those hunt winners are And that's at. bro science. Utah, <laughs> thank you so much for giving them all the Montana. <laughs> all right, there we go. Moving on. Real quick on that one, I've got a, I'll start off the Q and A here if you want to go back a slide or I can just ask it, but those raffle tags, um, you know, I, I understand Montana because I've played in that one, but other states, is there any raffle tags where, where states show you how many were, were sold? I'm just curious, like if, if somebody can find those draws on that like raffle tag. Like how many tag, applicants or, or how many participants there was or yeah, how many yeah, entries like were how many, Yep, how many entries were bought versus obviously the one person who got the tag. Um, I've always been slightly curious how other states did that. And since I know you guys have played in that, Robert, um, do they ever disclose that information of how many they sold? Not, not all states do, but some of them do. Montana doesn't. You have to call them and we've done that, and, you know, get the numbers. And they'll tell you how many were sold and then you divide that by five. But like Oregon has a list of kind of, you know, what's been sold. Idaho on their super tags, it has like a running tally. So you can see like how many tags have been sold to kind of give you an idea. Um, but a lot of guys, big money guys have started to play the raffle and they'll look and be like, you know, there was a guy in Montana that dropped $40,000 on the sheep tag, 40,000 bucks. And he won it. And what did the tag sell for this 360, year? 360. Right? So, I mean, he did that for two years <laughs> in value. a row. Yeah. So he was into it 80,000 and won it. And, you know, like on the super tags, there's a lot of guys that used to figure out the numbers. Hey, if I drop five grand, I'm, I'm one in three, you know, so you can play the game lots of ways and depends on how deep your pockets are, but I'm just a one raffle ticket in each guy, but not every state will publish those. I think I believe Washington, Oregon do for sure. Yeah, Washington um, is but you know, there's other ones out there. You used that, to backdoor a little bit where you could go in and you'd see, cause a lot of the states would publish how much money they raised in that raffle. Yeah. And so you could divide cross, it by the total, yes, by the, by the cost of the entries and you could figure out how many entries was in there but it's a little hit and miss. I will say this. I will say most state raffles draw odds are probably better than what you see at these big shows when they raffle off a sheep tag or something like that. You know, a lot of guys just forget to buy them. You know, some States like Colorado, I believe Garth, is it 25 tickets is the max you can buy? They, for they limit, species? they limit for, they limit the species or limit the number. I'm not sure, but they do limit yeah. that. And that's the ones I like to get in on because I know that no one's going and dumping forty thousand dollars. <laughs> hey, but even the guys that dumped forty thousand, like last year, we'll just go off on a tangent. Idaho Super Tag. If you draw that, you know, the, or it's a super pack, you get the moose, you get antelope, you get deer and elk. The girl that drew it bought one ticket, so there's always a chance. Yeah. And there was guys that were into that twenty thousand bucks because I knew a guy. One ticket, she won it. it only takes one. 
Okay. Any other questions, Dylan, on raffles? Nope. Nope. Okay. Super interesting. All right. This is going to be the first heartbreaking slide. Uh, we saw a lot of questions in the initial Q&A that came over, the preloaded questions uh, around sheep and sheep hunting. So we're just going to break that heart right out of the gate. Uh, this table represents all of the non-resident tags that are available. These are not guaranteed. Keep this in mind because uh, in some cases you'll see like in Arizona and Idaho, if you look at those two columns and then Washington, Wyoming, it's an up to, right? <clears throat> Which means that they may or may not go to a non-resident and they may instead go to a resident. But this is all of the lower 48 sheep tags available to non-residents through the draw system, period. So the max would have been 187 and one disclaimer there in the state of Washington, you can see there's a big, big old number there. But in Washington, there is no distinction between residents and non-residents and Washington residents pay like seven bucks an application to apply. We pay $110.50 an application to apply. So in short, virtually all of those Washington state tags go to residents. So you can pretty much subtract 30 out of that number. So people ask all the time, should I play the sheep game or not? I just tell people from my point of view, it's a donation to conservation, wild sheep, struggle everywhere. I have a friend that once said the only thing they're good at is dying. Uh, you know, they disease out easy and whatever else. So I never feel bad when I've been applying for sheep for 20 years in up to nine different states. I don't have a sheep tag yet, but the reality is it's good for conservation. So I happily make my donation. I will say one exception to that before we move on. Most people who finally draw a sheep tag are dying for help. And so I've been on a lot of sheep hunts because it's a sheep hunt is about a great experience, camaraderie, camp, the country that they live in, et cetera. So never be afraid to just put yourself out there and be like, hey, I, I wanna go on, a, I may never draw a sheep tag, but I wanna go on a sheep hunt or more. And you can almost always find somebody who's got a sheep tag in their pocket that would love an extra set of eyeballs on top of a peak. Well, and, and one thing about sheep, at least from my application strategy, when I go forth it, if, if you're on a budget and you can't put, you know, 150 bucks here or pay for the whole tag over here. I typically look at some of the states that I apply in that allows me to just add that species on for an application fee. It's a, it's same thing. Like you said, it's a raffle ticket at the end of the day, but at least your name's in the hat. And for an extra application fee of 15 or 20 bucks, man, you got your name there. That's a good point. Two more things I want to say about sheep. Never, ever, ever do points only on sheep. <laughs> The odds are drawing are so horrible. If you draw the tag, you can move anything that you had planned. So always put in for the sheep tag. There is thousands of guys in every state that go points only and they think, well, I'm gonna get 10, 15, 20 points and I'll draw. You're never guaranteed to draw a sheep tag unless you started in Wyoming a long, long time ago. So never do points only, always have your name in the hat. There's always a chance. If you do draw it, you clear your schedule and get your buddies because you're gonna have an amazing hunt. Two. There is another option to go sheep hunting, and that's in Montana. They have the unlimited sheep areas. They have five units that are over the counter, and they're on a quota. Once two rams are killed, the quota closes. Anyone who's an elite member, we cover that in the April issue. We go in-depth on a whole article on the unlimited sheep. You can go back and look at last year's or the April will be coming out, but that's, you know, answer a lot of your questions there on the unlimited stuff. Yeah, perfect. Well said, we're going to move on and try to find some better news. Here's some great news. We can hunt elk every year. That is true. Tell every us how, year. Robert. So a lot of guys call in and they say, hey, I want to hunt elk every single year. And that my, my advice to them is get yourself on a, like a five-year schedule. And what I do is I look at Idaho first. Now, again, everybody's going to have a different opinion, but Idaho tags go on sale December 1st. I believe there was the neighborhood of 25 or 30,000 people that logged <laughs> on this December 1st. So I didn't get an elk tag, my wife did, but that's kind of my first shot every year if I'm not a resident or if I don't live in a state that has you know elk that I can get an easy tag, Idaho is gonna be my first option. December 1st, I'm gonna go hard there for an archery rifle tag. If I don't get that, then I'm going to apply Wyoming for elk on the next go round. I'm probably gonna go the general cause I just wanna hunt. And you can typically draw that tag every three to four years. In, in the random draw, because Gar said 25% of those go random, you know, you're you're close to 10% on that random draw. Well, you the know? special was 30. And the special was 30. So yeah. if you got yeah, more money, three. you can go special. So 
I'm going to go Wyoming. We're going to apply January 31st as the deadline. Then after that, I'm going to look at Montana. And I'm a huge fan of Montana. And that's where Onyx is. I live there. I get an over-the-counter tag. But as a non-resident, you can typically draw a tag every third year. Now, again, 25% of those tags go random. You could draw one earlier than that. But think about it every third year. Well, Montana is going to tell me if I drew my tag prior to Wyoming getting around to, you know, telling me if I drew or not. So if I drew Montana and I'm like, man, I can only do one tag this year, then I'm going to withdraw my Wyoming app by a point. So I've kind of, if Idaho, I strike out, Montana and Wyoming are next. If I strike out in Montana, I'm putting, going all in on Wyoming. And if I don't draw that, I've got over the counter options like Colorado. They do have a bunch of second and third rifle seasons that's over the counter. And they have a bunch of archery units that are over the counter. If you like to chase spikes, don't you laugh. Hand cows. cows. Every cows. year, hand cows. <laughs> yeah, it's uh -huh. illegal to shoot a spike in most areas of Montana. Uh -huh. But you can come down in Utah and you can hunt these world famous units, you know, Pavant, you know, Dutton, Monroe, and you can hunt spikes. So that's an option for archery hunters um, and even into the rifle season. And then, like I said, Colorado, you know, I'm still going to buy that license every year and I'm going to build some points. Because with a couple points, you know, anywhere from one to five, I can't upgrade my unit because they have the over-the-counter units that are unlimited, but then they have units set aside where they've set the number of tags, where in reality, the quality might be about the same for elk, but I've got tons of people or maybe I only have a hundred. So it's just another way when I get to that three or four points in Colorado, then I'm going to be like, hey, I'm going to go ahead and burn my points this year and I'm going to hunt Colorado. So by playing this game and bouncing around, you can pretty much guarantee yourself, even if you live in the Midwest or the East, you can hunt elk every single year. Yeah, realistically, I think what it boils down to is it just depends on how hard you want to hunt for that elk. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if these states completely shoot down, Oregon still has some over-the-counter tags in Washington, but those would definitely be, you know, more emergency, last-minute things if all this fell through. Yeah. All right, let's do the same thing for mule deer, Garth. Yeah. So for mule deer, honestly... It, it's a little bit trickier because you don't have the same over-the-counter opportunity in a lot of these different states unless unless it comes to archery because archery you'll have a little bit more opportunity as far as that goes but the way i would go through it honestly you probably have to start off at the same point in idaho right now that's probably that, that's not what i would start off with but it does allow you to put a tag in your pocket at the earliest opportunity so once you get that tag in your pocket man, at least you have something to fall back on. Cause as I said earlier, it's hard to get an over the counter tag. Um, and mule deer is for the most part a draw, but that's why this is kind of a strategy in building points going forward. So the only reason I say Idaho wouldn't be my first choice right now is just cause they're a little bit down. I mean, they're a little bit off. They've had some winter kill. It's been a little bit rough over there lately. No, it has. The winter kill is pretty tough. I mean, I think that things are turning around right now. Um, I think we're looking good, you know, going into the future. You know, we had two bad back-to-back -back fawn loss years. So we've got this age gap that's missing coming up. But I do think in the next few years, it's going to be good. With Idaho, not to jump in here, Garth, but there may only be five or six units that I would go for. So December 1st, I get on the list. If I get a low enough number on the list, and those tags are still available, I would buy, you know, my one through seven choice. If I got that unit, I'd be excited. If I didn't, I might pass on Idaho. But then even if I got one of the tags I wanted, you already got the tag and the license. When the draw comes around, you can throw in for the limited entry draw and try to upgrade your tag significantly. And that's a low barrier of entry. Um, you know, I think they raised the price from 1450. I don't remember what it is now, but they raised it up a little bit, but I mean, it's still cheap Yeah, still, as applications go. Cause you don't have to submit the whole tag fee on nope, your deer application. You don't. So again, Idaho, I wouldn't just take any tag cause some of them are pretty horrible right now. Yeah. Um, the white tail up North are hurting. A lot of the deer on the Wyoming border are hurting. And then the units that were still good while well, the hunting pressure went there. And a lot of years, the guys having two tags, they just, you know, just decimated the, the buck to do. I mean, the bucks are just it's sad. Yeah. They housed them. So like I say, Idaho, you have to start with because they go on sale December 1st for the following year. So like Robert said, if you're able to get one of those top five areas for general, it's probably worth it. But after that, it's really time to focus on some of these other States and Montana, similar situation there, as far as from the elk standpoint, you can put in for that deer combo tag or the big game combo tag there. And it's about the same. I mean, you're looking at one to three years, you know, they have a random draw, so you can still pick one up in the random draw. Um, 
so jump over to that. And the cool thing is, is you can hunt deer during the rut in November. I mean, it's not, it's not the biggest bucks in the West, but at the same time, it is, it's a really, it's a really solid hunt. And there's a lot of country over there that you can go in and hunt. After that, if you're not going to like, if, 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 once you have your application in there, then it's time to start kind of leaning on some of these other states for where you've built points up. Uh, Colorado is going to be the next one. And it's a preference draw state. Honestly, they have so many hunts there for mule deer from zero points to you name it. I mean, 25 points, but really from zero to seven points, there's so many options because they have archery, muzzleloader, second rifle, third rifle, fourth rifle seasons to select from. If you haven't put something together there and you have a point or two or even zero points and want to back up, go for it. Like there's plenty of opportunity there. So I use Colorado as my back pocket state. How many years have you not hunted deer in Colorado? In the last um, five. In the last five? Yeah. I don't know. One. Yeah. I mean, I, I hunted about every single year. You're probably the same. Because there's an opportunity to go. I mean, the last 20 <clears throat> years, there's probably been three times I haven't hunted it. So that's why I use that for my backup. I want to throw one thing in for Colorado, the turn back tags. So if you turn a tag back and it takes under five points to draw, it goes into a system where they throw them online, everybody can look at them, and then later it goes on sale at a certain time, and whoever gets in there and gets them, those tags don't cost you any points. I mean, stand here in the office, how many tags did he get last year? For, for people. Yeah, I was going to say, I think you're not one. <laughs> <laughs> Stan only had one tag, but, but he helped other people get tags. But yeah, I mean, yeah. that's that's a really good opportunity. That's how I got my tag last year. Um, I didn't draw. I was supposed to draw, but it fell on the third season. And as everyone knows, that put in for third season hunts last year. Didn't go so well. Most of them jumped. Second season was terrible. So what happened is, yeah, we he got me a tag. Actually, Austin got me the tag. And then Stan got a couple other tags for other individuals. So, yeah, it's a good point to make. And there, there's that opportunity in Nevada too, which is the next state I'll touch on. Um, Nevada, basically, if you are an archery hunter, there is better opportunity for individuals to draw tags every so often, every one to three years. And that's because the point system works for that for non-residents. Um, and if you're a rifle hunter, they do have some better than average hunts, or I'd say average hunts that you can still draw on the earlier rifle hunt in October. The later hunts, that's a different story. It's a long haul. Most of the other ones are going to be a long haul if you're not going for archery. But there is a few areas like up around six and seven that you can get in on, on that early rifle hunt. So after that, then I look at Utah. And I guess Utah's application technically is a little before Nevada. But as I mentioned earlier, the general deer is on a preference-based system. So build a couple points up for that. Most of the archery and muzzleloader tags for non-residents in these general units can be drawn with one to three points. Um, there's a few out there now because of some tag reductions and things like that for rifle hunts that are going to take four to five, maybe six at the most. But quite honestly, some of these general hunts in Utah, and it's not because Utah is doing something right. It's because other states have probably slacked off and the quality has suffered a little bit. But I would argue and say a lot of the Utah general hunts are probably just as good as some low point Colorado, late November rut hunts in Montana. Um, a lot of your Wyoming generals, I think they got similar quality. So it's not like you're, it's not just because it's a general tag doesn't mean it's a bad hunt. It's still a pretty good opportunity. So to just help add another state to where you can put a tag in your pocket, that's a good one to have in your rotation. And last but not least, I would say Wyoming. Um, if you're not chasing down like Region G or some of these other areas, a lot of the general regions in Wyoming for deer and non-residents, it's, it's a general tag, but it's still limited, just like Montana and, and Utah's general. They have a limited number. Um, but they're about one to three points. I mean, you get up to H and K and you're talking two to three points. Most of the other regions within that state, you know, like W and that, they're one point you know, two points to draw and they're good hunts. You know, they're, they're not, they're not trophy hunts by any means, but it definitely puts you in a situation where you have a deer tag in your pocket. And the one thing about mule deer that, that I use it for, because there's not a lot of over the counter opportunities, 
opportunities in these states is basically have these states in your rotation, build points up, you know, allow you opportunities to look at some states and say, okay, I can't draw here this year. I don't have a very good shot, but I have points in this state. So I'm going to book that hunt. I'm going to put in, I'm going to go on that, especially in these states that have preference draws. Okay, I can see we're already at 640. So <clears throat> we're going to blow through this one fairly fast so we can get to some Q&A. I want to make sure people get an opportunity to ask some questions. Uh, we do. There are some ways to game the system. <clears throat> we, uh, you can do what we call point sharing, where you apply a non-hunter to build points. Uh, in most cases, they have to get a hunter's uh, ed certificate, but it's not hard to do. Um, and then you can share their points. Some states that uh, quite a few of us do that in, Arizona, Wyoming, Nevada, Utah, um, great places to kind of think outside the box, build points ahead of time. You got family or friends who are non-hunters, but willing to, well, you know, and you can pay, pay for it. Um, there's ways to transfer your tag in some states. Um, particularly to youth under the age of 18, Oregon, Arizona, and Idaho all have options there. And then uh, one of the ways we gain the system a little bit financially, because that's one of the questions we saw a lot here too, is if you buy your hunting license at the right time, and it's a 365 day license, uh, then sometimes you can get multiple applications out of the same one. We always buy, for example, if you apply in Alaska, we buy a future year. Alaska lets you buy, is it three? Three. three. Up to three different years, the current year and up to two years out. And a part of that's because of the way they do their bear draws uh, for like when you apply for it, it's for the following spring and all that stuff. But anyway, if you game the system a little bit, you can get multiple applications out of these particular states uh, because they're a 365 day license. So you just have to buy it at the right time during the application period so that you're going to get two applications out of it. Arizona is kind of weird because it's you're only going to get like one uh, elk and deer sheep and another elk out of it or vice versa because it's got two draws. But and then uh, obviously there's plenty of places, too, that you can return your tag. Uh, so Utah up to 30 days, you will not get a point anymore if you if you do turn it back in for that year. Arizona up to the day before you can get your point for that year. You got to use point guard to do that. It's like an extra five bucks when you go into the draw and then Colorado up to 30 days before the season. And that's where some of these tags you're talking about are coming in into yeah. play uh, that you guys are getting. You do not get a point for the current year if you do that. And then finally, Nevada, you can turn your tag back in, but all the party members have to turn the tag back in. So if you go in as a party, you can't split that anymore like you used to. You got to turn, everybody's got to turn it in and you do get a point for <coughs> that year. for Utah too. Yeah, Utah's the same, that's true. So anyway, some ways to game the system can help out a little bit. And then uh, for suggestions, we always suggest that you build a budget-based strategy. I look at it from a monthly point of view. What would I spend per month to invest in my long-term hunting strategy? And I think most people, if you can start around like 50 bucks a month, uh, so you're talking $600 a year, it actually gets you a pretty interesting strategy. A lot of these states that you guys threw up here, you can be in the game for all those states and be building points and going on hunts every single year. Um, and then, of course, we'd already talked about raffles. And then here at Hunt and Fool, a couple of things that we do for our members. Again, I mentioned even uh, elite members with the digital membership. You still have our member draw connection where we have over 26,000 previous tag holders that we can connect you with most of the time when you draw a good tag and they help you out. And then, obviously, you want to research as hard as you can. And that's probably where a lot of the questions are going to come in at the end here. Uh, mapping systems like Onyx and the evolution there has, is mind-blowing compared to what I used to do 20 years ago. Um, draw odds, like our Hunt and Fool Draw Odds calculator is so transparent at telling you where you actually stand to draw tags. Our e-magazine is filled with research that these guys and other teammates write, and we spend hundreds of hours per state section talking to outfitters, talking to wildlife biologists, talking to, quite frankly, tons of members who have hunted those tags too. Uh, anyway, and then of course we have a free app as well and a podcast, both that are dedicated to telling you how to go on more hunts like this as well. The app is mostly about push notifications. I don't know, Dylan, what do you think? Should we, should we skip to some Q and a, or should we pre-anticipate? We've got like eight questions loaded that were the most common questions. Can you weigh in on that, Dylan? Yeah, no, I would say uh, the, the most common questions that were preloaded would probably probably be a good place to start. And then I see we have some queued up 
uh, for the live Q and A that we can get to afterward. Um, and I also wanted to just interject really quick, obviously for myself and everybody listening after, you know, learning and I learned a lot there myself just in those slides and I'll be referencing those as this application season and, and others um, follow but you know like like myself and everybody listening like everybody knows you only have uh, a limited amount of time effort you know funds for these tags and to go without knowing some of these things would be you know you're always wondering am I am I making the best choice in applying for Colorado this year versus next year, et cetera. And so my point here is like, obviously the, the folks at Huntful are incredibly knowledgeable and it's, it's just a no brainer to consult you guys on these type of things, because I don't have the time myself, like a lot of folks to, to know the information that, that you guys do. So I just wanted to, to call that out real quick. Cause yeah, just going through that, I learned a lot myself there. So, um, but yeah, I think it would be good to just kind of answer a few of the all encompassing questions that we gathered um, before, and then we can dive into Q and A. Okay, perfect. Robert, do you wanna take this one? Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, we get that question all the time. What are the best dates to build points in depending on your age? You know, let's just say, um, you know, there was one question that's already hit on the board that said, I'm in my sixties, decades of collecting points is out of the question. So what do you recommend strategy? For him, that person, I would be like the random states, New Mexico. Idaho, you know, the places where you're not in the point game and you're just trying to draw the random tag. Maybe I would make sure I went in pretty deep on the raffles, not a lot of money, but got my name in the hat in each one of those. And then I would look at what I, what my plans are, if I'm elk or deer, what's, what can I do short term? Maybe that's a Wyoming general hunt. If I want a guided hunt and a horseback in a thoroughfare on a great adventure, or if I'm a do-it-yourself guy, you know, and I would be looking at what I could do you know, that's the big thing here is we help guys do a short-term plan, you know, and then like a five-year plan, a 10-year plan, and a lifetime plan, you know, so that's what I would look at. If I was 60, I would be looking at nothing beyond that short-term, you know, within the next five years, what could I do? What can I make my money work for me? That's what I'd do. If you were 18, it all depends on which kind of your, you know, your application budget is, and it's maybe like, hey, we want to get in in Nevada. We want to get in in Arizona because we know we're going to be in these for a long time. You know, I'm going to be looking at Colorado because I want to hunt that every five years. So it really depends on what your age is and what you want to do. But the next thing is how much money are you willing to spend unrefundable? You know, it's, it's your age, what your priorities and trophy expectations are, and then what's your budget. And then with that, we can help build it. But, you know, that guy that's in his 60s, I would be looking at all the random states. That's what I'd be looking at. I wouldn't go in the point game. I would just try to draw and go hunting. See, and I would, I would probably say some of those point states, depending on his expectations, he's got a better shot drawing Colorado or Wyoming general. I mean, oh. some of those easy to draw tags with building those points than putting in for New Mexico and the random draw in 16. I well, mean, for elk. I mean, yeah, basically follow the two slides that you guys put yeah. up realistically. Yeah. Well, yeah. think about it. All of us here in the office, I don't think there's any of us that hunt three or more point units in Colorado. Correct. We're all zero to three points, yep. except for Jared. We're zero to three points. I'm just so banking them, banking them. But you know, so yeah, I, Garth is right. But if that would come in, would I say the the you know short term five year strategy? Yeah, I can guarantee myself a general Wyoming elk tag in five years. I yep. can guarantee myself a pretty darn good Colorado third season tag in five years. You know, those are the things that. Yes, we might get in the point game, but we're not getting in the point game for the Arizona Strip. Maybe yeah. we're getting in the point game for a coos deer in yeah. Arizona, Correct. but not the Arizona Strip. Yeah, exactly. And, and that, what all that comes down to is draws again, right? Like mm -hmm. it's about understanding where preference point draws are from a point point of view. And Colorado is really interesting one. You can see it across the board. You're at 25 up at the top, you know, or, or more, right up at the top of the Colorado point pile. You'll have a half a dozen to 50, 12 units that are really hard to draw that you're never going to catch. And then all of a sudden there's always a jump in every weapon type in every season. There's a little bit of a jump that goes down to six Correct. or seven right yep. there. And again, those are the ones that you should be looking at and saying, Hey, I can go on these in, with a fairly short term strategy, as opposed to swinging for the fence for those. You'll never ever catch a yeah. 25 point and draw. What I've learned in Colorado and Garson told me this for years is weather kills big bucks. And you know, a lot of these guys draw 44 third and they spent 25 points and it's 70 degrees and they're in a t-shirt and they have a horrible hunt. Yeah. You got to hit the weather. And if you can hunt Colorado more often, say five times out of 10 years, 
Your odds go up a hit in weather. Better chance of hitting that weather than that one time in 25 years. Uh -huh. So hunt it as often as you can, hope for the weather, learn the units. You know, you'll do better long term in Colorado than you will waiting for the phenomenal, you know, sought after tech. Yeah. yeah. The other problem that we run into a lot here lately with big game wildlife management, having gone downhill across the board, I think we'd all agree with that, that, you know, 25, 30 years ago, uh, the, the kind of trophy potential has just continued. We're, we're over hunting. We're getting more success. I shouldn't say we're over hunting. We're more successful and we're kind of taking the top of the age class down. And so a lot of times when we get asked this question, if you, you've got to ask yourself the question, do I want to hunt or do I need a 200 inch deer or do I need a 380 plus type bull? If those are your questions, then it is a long or lucky or wealthy strategy, period. Yeah. No exceptions. And even then it's pretty tough. Yeah. Okay. There, I can answer this one really quickly. There is no way to combat point creep. No. Um, it's going to happen at the state level if it happens at all. I believe that some states are so perpetually ridden with a heavy old mature point system that they are going to have to take action. Uh, that's going to quite frankly create a lot of turmoil on high point holders. They're going to be grumpy and upset about it, but I think that's the only thing that you can do outside of insulating yourself and going hunting more often uh, while you can. All right, the difference between a general and special slash limited entry draw. This is a super confusing question because every state makes it, well, I shouldn't say every state, lots of states make it confusing. I'll use Montana as a prime example. Montana has a general draw and a special slash limited entry draw that literally happens simultaneously if you are applying for both. So in Montana, you're applying for a big game combo license, which is either a deer only, an elk only, or a deer elk combo. Uh, that's your combo license. Your, your name goes in the hat for it. If you're successful in it, then Montana looks kind of simultaneously. We've never figured it out exactly and says, oh, Robert has also applied for the elk horns or the bear paws or another great unit in Montana. And then they look at this special unit opportunity for him. So as a general rule, that's kind of what it's like in most states, although like in Utah, it's confusing because the general draw, like Garth mentioned earlier, is for general deer, which is separate from limited entry deer. The general is a title only. Yes. Except for and it's residents. Mis and it's misleading and misused. There's no common state vernacular that completely dials it in. So. Yeah. Like Idaho's general deer used to be available in all general units. Now your general tags one unit and you have to pick it. So still called general, but unless you're a resident, but it's not very general anymore. It's pretty it's specific. It yeah. It, it gets this. Little... Okay. I think we covered new to hunting, need a strategy for some of those zero to two points. I mean, you guys knocked that out of the park, in my opinion, for deer and elk, both uh, the moral of the story is don't wait around this question. I'm trying to re read between the lines. I think, you know, you're looking for a quality over the counter hunt. The question originally just said, I need, how do you select an over the counter hunt? You know, obviously you utilize every resource you can, like the data that's embedded in your Onyx mapping platform, uh, all of the hunt and fool tools. And like Robert pointed out earlier, our uh, July and August issues are specifically dedicated to trying to vet out on behalf of our members, the best over the counter opportunities out there, bar none. And that's based on, again, conversations with outfitters, harvest data, uh, members, et cetera. Personal experience, too. Yeah, and that's why we do them in July and August, is by then, 90% of all the state draws have come out. We get tons of members that call in because they swung for the fences and put in for great units instead of just trying to go hunting. And now they're scrambling and they don't have a hunt. So that's why those two months, we break down all the better over-the-counter opportunities so guys can just go hunting. Because bottom line, we just want to help our members go on more hunts. Even if it's just a, you know, for take your kid out and hopefully shoot a nice little fork and horn or three point deer. It's Make some memories. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it and it gets difficult with over the counter hunts. The only reason that like some of the things that I look for, we use harvest success in in our breakdowns of those units, kind of as a guideline. But a lot of these states don't have mandatory harvest success, so it's kind of a read between the lines, especially if it jumps from forty percent one year to eleven percent <laughs> the next year. Yeah. But overall, like what I do, I, I look at a lot of different areas, like hunting pressure is one thing I look at, Yeah. you know, the amount of roadless country in an area is something I look at, um, the, or, or the amount of roads and, and the amount of country in between those roads can eliminate a lot of hunters and things like that. And ultimately, I think the most thing I get from when I talk to people looking for a quality over the counter hunt, they always look at hunting pressure. Yeah. You know, how do I get away from the hunting pressure? Yeah. And sometimes the units with the most wilderness aren't necessarily the best ones to select because everyone else 
that picked that unit picked it to go into the wilderness. Well, that's one thing about on X that it makes me laugh is guys will turn the wilderness layer on and they're like, that's where I'm going. <laughs> and so yeah. I love hunting that country, you know, halfway between the trailhead and the wilderness, because that's walked by, by everybody. Yeah. That's my little kind of area where I like to, to live. It's It'll still spot. kick your butt to get in and out every 100%. single day, but yeah. 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 And oftentimes animal densities are a little lower in true wilderness areas too, quite frankly, prey densities, because they, the predator prey balance is a little more uh, tilted to normal or whatever you want to call yeah. it. So I've, I've hunted a lot of wilderness area that hasn't had much for elk sign in it and deer sign at times. Not saying that you like can't the bob, hunt, like the bob, <laughs> <laughs> plenty of grizzly bears, <laughs> plenty of grizzlies. Okay. And then one thing we didn't touch on when it comes to selecting an OTC hunt is remember that you're looking for the type of experience that you seek. That's, yeah. you know, you touched on it from a, people don't want hunter pressure point of view, but if you want to see, if you want to be able to glass and see elk and deer and, and get into high country and maybe walk by a beautiful high mountain lake and set your camp up with that, then you're going to have to try to remember that it's not just about the hunt. There is an experience factor too, yeah. particularly on OTC hunts, because they are typically low success, high pressure. That's the one thing you can control is the experience you have. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause there could be a high success hunt, you know, in Western Oregon, well, it's a jungle and blackberry thickets. You can't see more than 30 feet. Poison oak. I'm going to be miserable <laughs> there, but you know, it's just, you want to, you want to have a good experience in country. You want to, if you're a big glasser, you know, go to those units. If you're a big caller, <clears throat> go to those units. Yep. Yeah. Yep. For sure. Uh, we get asked this question a lot. What are the fees associated with applying? We refer to them in two different categories, out of pocket, uh, which means non-refundable. The state's taking those, they're keeping them. It's not coming back to you. And then refunded money. This used to be a bigger deal. Now there's only a couple of states that really hit your credit card hard. New Mexico and Wyoming being the two biggest. Idaho. Yeah, Idaho. yeah and Idaho for Idaho. especially the big three, sheep, moose, and goat. Uh, they'll hit your credit card, hammer you hard, and sit on your money for a little while before it comes back. But most other states have gone away from that. And now your the out-of-pocket cost is very close to what your net is. Oh, meat hunts. This is actually probably a decent one to touch on. And then let's transition out to Q&A. How late are you guys willing to do this, Dylan? So we, we can stay on um, really as long as you guys want to, but we can try and wrap yeah. it up, you know, 10, 15 minutes after seven, if that works for you guys that way. We we'll can party all night. Yeah, we get paid by the hour. So <laughs> all night. Perfect. And yeah. what's great, I you know, these questions that you guys are going through now, I'm, I'm looking through the questions as you're answering them. And it's, it's knocking out several um, of the ones uh, questions in the, the Q&A. So that's perfect. Um, I'd say we can wrap this up and then dive into the, the Q&A for as long okay. as we wish and then wrap it up. Okay, perfect. Robert, you want to kick us off on meat hunts? So meat hunts, um, I'm, I, when I think of meat hunts, I think of like antlerless. And, you know, I'll hunt cow elk. I love shooting cow elk. I love shooting white tail does. I won't shoot a mule deer doe just because the mule deer are struggling so hard. I'm not going to shoot one. <laughs> I, I just, I cannot do it. I won't let my kids do it. If you do it, that's fine. But I'm just like, there's so few of them. I don't want to shoot mule deer does. So, and if I'm looking at cow hunts, you know, I'm going to look at some of the easy to draw tags. Wyoming's got some reduced price tags um, that you can go in on the draw. It's totally random. If you draw a tag, lots of public land you know, um, Utah's loaded with them. Montana's got a ton. Idaho's got a ton. So if I had bought a license for those states like Nevada, Utah, you know, then, then I'm going to go after the cow tags in Nevada in, in these states. So pretty much any of these states that you've already bought a license, like Utah will have their cow moose and stuff come up later in the year and I'll apply for those. Um, but, you know, like I said, when my freezer is full, or empty, then I'm going to start looking for cow hunts, you know, or, or white tailed doe hunts, you know, just because, you know, in Montana, we can shoot a bunch of those with a bow on the river bottom. But, you know, I, I kind of leave mealy does alone just because they're just, their whole population's sad <laughs> right now. They do struggle pretty bad, yeah. don't they, Gar? Yeah, no, I think Robert <laughs> nailed like the key states. The point is, if you really look for, if you're really looking for a freezer filling hunt, the opportunities abound. They can just be confusing to sort through sometimes. Like Montana, uh, you know, you've got B tags that are an extra tag. So you get an extra, you know, let's say for example, you're going on a bull hunt, you might be able to get a B tag in the same exact unit and kill two elk, a bull and a cow. Is that a shoulder? Is that a shoulder no, season? not necessarily. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of times it is, but a lot of times it's during the main season too. Yeah, Actually, I believe you can kill three elk in Montana. <laughs> Yeah. Because of the shoulders. Can, because of the shoulders. Now a lot's changing this year in Montana. It's yeah. complete cluster, but 
you know, there's, there's lots of opportunities like here in Utah, if you had a spike tag, could you also get a cow tag? Yeah, mm -hmm. you can get a cow tag. It's, it's, just, it's similar. To, it's similar to Colorado. So Colorado has a similar type thing where you can have one either sex tag and an antlerless tag. So even though your spiked archery tag is an either sex, you can also have a cow tag on top of that. In Colorado, it's similar. You can have an A tag and a B tag. Um, typically, your A tags, you can have an, like, say, an either sex archery tag. Then you can also have an antlerless B tag, but you can't have two A tags. Two so A it, and, and that's where, like, most of these states, like you had said, have separate draws yep. that are separate from the main draw. Then you get to states like Colorado and Arizona, where Arizona is the same. If you put in as a first choice and you got 27 elk points for a cow tag, they're yeah. gone. Yeah. They'll yeah. take them. Smoked them. And so you just got to make sure and disseminate that. And the same thing for Colorado, it's in the same draw. So if you put an antlerless draw down as your first choice, they will take your points. But the cool thing is, is if you put in as a second choice, there's a lot of those cow hunts that go as a second choice and they don't affect your points at all. You'll gain a point for that year's application if you don't draw your first choice. And then you can draw that cow tag. You know, there's a lot of different hunts that you can draw a cow tag. It's guaranteed as a second choice and go on it. So one of my favorite, you know, meat hunts, and I've never, you know, used my points for that, but we get a lot of guys that, hey, man, I'm into Wyoming, 16 points. I'm so far behind the curve. Am I ever going to draw Colorado? I'm into moose four or five points. Am I ever going to draw Montana? I'm into moose 10. I just, I'm not getting anywhere. Well, they all offer cow hunts. Like I remember how many, four moose. or five years ago, cow yeah. moose hunts. Yeah. I come running into Gar's office and I'm like, hey, is this right? Am I reading this right? Were these tags like second choice? And then did you and Sarita both draw? Yeah, we, we both drew and I turned my tag back in and now I'm trying to play catch up <laughs> because we did such a good job of promoting the fact. <laughs> That's what Unfold did right there. We ruined the draw. It's for cow moose in Colorado. But yeah, I mean, and it, it was a great hunt. I mean, she, she got a moose and then I've tried to, I've tried to draw it ever since and I haven't done it again. But the other reason, that, well, the other part of that is because it's $2,000. Yep. So it's the same price as a bull moose tag for an antlerless moose tag. And that was the one reason. And the fact that I don't think a lot of people realize that, hey, you can get that literally still in the, within the three-year preference period of applying. So there wasn't enough tags to go around to even make it to that weighted point draw. And be careful with Wyoming too. Like you talked about Arizona, there's type one and type two and type nine licenses that we typically cover type one and type two, maybe a season difference or the unit split in half type nine is archery, but there's also a full price. that's type four, type four, the type four is a cow tag. And that will take all your points. Yep. And like Arizona, if you're lucky enough to do point guard, you can get your 27 elk points back Wyoming. You're done. So, and a lot of guys I've talked to that were chasing, you know, I talked to a guy the other day had eight points, been chasing a bull tag. He's going to, you know, draw the type four and unit 100 and it's like 92% success on cows or something ridiculous like that and yeah. go have a good hunt. So, you know, if you get into the point game and you're like, I'm not gaining anywhere, but I'd be happy, you know, going to an antler list, some of those states are points you can use and you can draw those tags. Yeah. If you want to go into that separate draw for Wyoming, that's a separate draw from the ones that use your points, it's a six or seven, type yeah. six or seven. And that price. one's going to be up six or seven and that's reduced price no points everybody's equal yep okay q a oh, i thought there was another slide in there but there's not yeah let's go uh let's go with some q a perfect i'll uh so the the one up front here i'll take here real quick so what are the biggest changes for any and all states for example i hear that wyoming is about to drastically reduce non-resident tag numbers soon uh, my answer to that one is stay tuned. So actually Hunt and Fool um, wrote a blog that we are going to be publishing on the Onyx website um, here within the next few days even um, that is specifically on this topic. So it's the biggest changes out West and it's broken down per state. So um, I would say check the blog, the Onyx blog over the next uh, few days to a week at the latest, and that will definitely be out. Um, so I don't know if you guys have some queued up on your guys's end. Again, kind of scrolling through here, um, you did a good job at answering a lot of these with the general questions, but uh, do you guys have any queued up that, that need attention? Yeah, I think so. I mean, we got a couple in the bank there. Um, we have one there we'll touch on. Um, how, do you, how do you know when it is time to cash in on the points you have accumulated? And, and I think part of that one, it's, it's kind of a bigger question, but yeah, how do you know, like Jared was saying earlier on Colorado, there are certain point breaks where you hit a certain number of points, like four or five in some states, and it's like, well, I can still apply for 
six more years and probably not get any better of a hunt than I could have cashed in on when I had five points or four points. So in my mind, it's time to cash those points in at that time frame instead of chasing down for six, seven years. Or you might be in a state or a, a draw where point creep is incredibly terrible and you just keep going. Like for instance, in Utah, point creep is, is terrible for non-residents. And so you look at a lot of these guys that have built up years and years of points, like 18, 19 points for elk. It doesn't matter how many more years you build points. You're probably still going to be able to draw the same exact tag you can draw it just now. Just follows right You're not going to catch up. Talking directly about me, <laughs> you know, I've got 19 points and I can draw the Manti archery elk, and I've been able to draw that for the last four years, but I haven't caught the next unit above. And it's like, you know, it, it, you know, the joke is in 10 years and I have 29. And is the Manti archery the only thing I'm going to be able to draw? One thing I would touch on this, people always ask when to cash in their points, Garth nailed it on the head. But another answer that I like to give is when you're ready to go on the hunt, everything changes. You know, right now, let's just say, you know, Colorado, your six points can draw that unit. Who's to say that Colorado doesn't do something crazy and say, hey, we're going to slash the number of non-resident tags in half. And then yeah. now it takes 12 points and you could have drawn it for the last four years and now you can't ever draw it. So everything changes. Idaho's changed. Oregon's changed. Wyoming's changing. If you have the points to go on a hunt and you have the time to go, I would go. I wouldn't keep putting it off. Could have a major winter kill. Could have a lot of things. So if you have the points to go on the hunt, I would go on the hunt and then get back in the bottom and start gaining again. Prime example is Jared. I, <laughs> easy, all the time. I, I mean, we already saw that happen in Arizona. He could have drawn 3C for a couple of years for a long time, and now all of a sudden he can draw it Boop, jumped because it jumped ahead. And I tease him when I say 76 is going to do the same thing oh, to him. I guarantee it is. <laughs> yeah, you're not wrong. Well, no. To interject on that again real quick, I mean, Robert and I had this conversation earlier this year or last year, if you will, and I knew that we were, we were expecting our first child. And I was like, Hey, my, my strategy is going to change this year. I'm not going to be able to get out. So, you know, things do change year to year and season to season. And that's where being dynamic with it. And it's like, you know, you might work with Huntful and, and have a strategic plan. Here's my plan. Here's my strategy. Well, things change. Like you can have a kid, you can, you know, get injured. I know folks in Montana this year who are excellent tags, like once in a lifetime tags, if you will, that, you know, had a, a knee ankle injury and, and couldn't go on the hunt. So I had to turn it back in. So things change in yeah, year to year. It's just, it's important to, to stay dynamic too, as I learned last year. Yeah. Don't yeah. be afraid to burn points. That's my big thing. You know, yeah. Just... Even if it takes two points and you have six, if it's the hunt you want to go on. Yeah. That's something that's really hard psychologically for a lot of people to do, including myself oh, it is. at times. It's really hard to leave quote unquote points on the table. Yeah. But one thing that we do say a lot too um, is, uh, you know, quantity of points do not necessarily equal inches of antler. Oh. We get that mistake all the time where it's like, well, if I, you know, if I get this many points in Colorado, I'm going to hunt 350 bulls or whatever. And the reality is, um, again, overall management for trophy potential has declined quite a bit in the last decade. Uh, you know, we study it probably more religiously than any, any one organization on the earth and it's, it's rough to watch. And so, like I said, don't get so attached to those points and equate those to inches of antler. The worst yeah. thing you can ever do is die with the Tom points. <laughs> yeah. That's well, just, you know, spend your money, spend your points. When you, when you cash yeah. out, cash out of everything. Yeah. Are you going to leave your kids an inheritance? Nope. <laughs> Absolutely not. Gonna I'm going to leave them a bunch of mounts. Uh, I'm going to let Robert take the next one. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to read this question and Gar's going to answer it. Huh. What do you expect to happen with Oregon preference points? With Oregon going to a draw only for archery elk this year, what do you expect to happen? I think <laughs> what's going to happen is all of these units they change from OTC to draw is going to suck a bunch of those guys that were myth chasing mythical units mm -hmm. and trying to cat catch them that way would never catch them. Now they're going to burn all their points and it's magically going to take 10 points to draw the Winnaha in two years. Oh. I think I doubt I, that. I, I, don't think that's gonna so, I like that. Honestly, I just did a podcast with Wayne Endicott today on this. And, you know, he's, you know, a wealth of knowledge in Oregon. It should probably be released, I don't know, for the next six or seven years. I'm not sure what the schedule is. But honestly, 
Oregon did this to try to burn points. There was too many guys that were hunting over the counter units, you know, like going into, you know, the Keating unit oh, or S Snake River. And they were literally going in, hunting those and building points. And then you got, you know, everybody's chasing the Winaha, Walla Walla, or Mount Emily. And they're all taking a ton of points to draw. The quality's going down. And I'm, you know, and then there's a couple outside outliers in there that were, you know, five or 10 points below. But no one was burning points every year. And Oregon's like, we got to get the point system rolling. So this is what we're going to do. They did leave a few units open, like the lookout unit, which I'm anticipating is going to get absolutely bombarded with people. And it'll be like a just shoulder to shoulder hunt. I hope not. Half that unit's private, half's public. I think it's going to get, you know, just filled up with people. The thing that is terrible about this for non-residents is Oregon holds us to our 5%. So Oregon Deer and elk, we get 5% of the tags. Outfitters can take 2.5% of those. Their draw takes place before ours. They get those tags. The outfitters apply for them, don't need help people to apply for them. And then they get them and they can sell them to whoever they want. So in reality, this year, we'll get 5% of the tags in Oregon as non-residents. Next year and going forward, we'll get probably 25 So let's just say the unit has 100 tags. So we're going to get five as non-residents. And let's just say only 25 residents apply. You know, so there's 70 tags that went undersubscribed. Well, all the non-residents that didn't get drawn, they're out. And Oregon's going to say, hey, guys, we have these over-the-counter tags. Go ahead and just pick them up right now. Last year, there was, I think, over 5,000. To residents only. To residents only. So non-residents aren't getting them. So I've been a huge fan of Oregon. I got 22 points. I've been applying there forever. And I used to hunt, you know, last year they did away with the uh, archery mule deer tags. So pretty much Eastern Colorado now. Most all deer units have went to a draw and Eastern most Oregon. Eastern Oregon. Yeah. Did I say Western? You said Colorado. I don't know, Colorado. <laughs> we know we're on Oregon though. Yeah, we're on Oregon. So essentially that over the counter opportunity is gone. And I, I can't understand it because Oregon literally is leaving so much money on the table for non-residents who'd pay 10 times as much for a tag. We're out. So I think it's going to take non-residents units that we've been hunting every single year. Now we're going to jump from two to five points. And, you know, it's just one of those things, like we talked about, everything changes. So go hunting when you can, because you might not be able to soon. So I think you, you're going to see, you know, possibly a little better bull quality because you're pulling so many hunters out of there. Um, I think for the most part, you're going to see over the counter opportunities for residents only because they'll be undersubscribed tags. But I wouldn't be surprised if Oregon looks at that after two years and say, well, if only a thousand people are applying and we're given 2000 tags, let's cut the quota down to a thousand. So that's, what's going to happen. I think it's Oregon is just not a pro hunting state, um, you know, from their, you know, management outside of the fishing game. And I mean, the predators are running wild. There's bears everywhere. There's, there's probably more black bears there than I'd assume anywhere. Um, mountain lions, highest density there is. There was one government trapper in one year killed hundred lions. That's impressive. Like <laughs> he's what? either dang good or in a high population area. <laughs> well, exactly. Probably a little bit of both. <laughs> so, and then the wolves are, you know, growing like crazy in there. So, I mean, I think it's going to have a huge impact on non-residents being able to get tags. Now we can still go hunt the jungle. We can go to Western Oregon and we can, you know, you know, go and hunt the, the, the patches. Blacktails and Roosevelt. Oh man, the blacktails and Roosevelt's what you're going to be chasing. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I think it's, it's going to help residents start burning those points, but non-residents, it's just going to pile us up even more points. And I mean, yeah. Oregon is not a pro non-resident state in the limited entry draw in the over the counter stuff. Like we can all go hunt, you know, blacktail archery and rifle rosies, archery and rifle on the West side over the counter state every year, but pretty much on the Eastern side, they just, just pretty much shut the faucet off. You know, so yep. it, it's just one of those things like everything changes oh. that five year circle where I would have had elk prior to this year, Oregon was there because you could go to the, you know, Eagle Caps, you go to Keating, you could go hunt all that stuff. It's gone. Everything changes. Yeah, that's a definite takeaway, which goes to the next point. Again, I think we've already touched on this quite a bit, but he basically says new to Western hunting or she uh, Midwest whitetail archery hunter. Welcome come out west realistically do i need to get a few points before i go out west absolutely not uh in fact if you don't want to take the chance on an expensive a more expensive tag one thing we talk to people about a lot of times too come out in the late spring and go on a spring bear hunt in idaho and scout your unit pre-scout your unit do something that's a little you know a lot of people get a little nervous about trying to take that first step to go hunting 
pick a species that's a little cheaper, pick something that's going to give you an experience, come on a fishing trip, bring the family out on vacation, toodle around the campsite on a side-by-side. -side. Archery, Arizona. Yeah, Archery, Arizona. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and to that Midwest archery hunter, it's more intimidating for us Westerners to go to Illinois or Iowa oh. on public land and try to hunt than it is for you to come out here. I mean, yeah. it is, there's so much opportunity, so many places to go. Again, I could fill my schedule from August till December 1st on over-the-counter hunts and literally never have to come back to work. And there's a misconception <laughs> with over-the-counter hunts, like that, that archery hunt I just got back from, me and Eric, Jared both just got back from in Arizona. There is not that many people out there. I mean, I know no. this, I know the statistics and the studies are saying that, yes, there's more people that are taking advantage of that hunt, but literally I think in four days, I ran into five people out in the field and I got stocks every single day. It's just, it's an easy way to come out here. Tons of public land. You're, you can go hunt deer. I mean, it's, I spotted coos deer every morning in my underwear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we literally camped right next to a ridge there's coos deer all over i just get up in the morning and throw the glasses up we don't have pictures of that yeah well we do but we're not going to share them uh yeah so don't wait and then uh do you want to talk about the montana preference point cap well so you you might have some more information on that so yeah, montana's changing right now everything's changing you know but montana has had long had a preference point cap and again keep in mind this is for the general combo licenses we talked about early earlier deer only tag elk only tag or the deer elk combination tag it's always had a it's always been a preference point draw i shouldn't say always but for many 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 years and it's always had a cap you could formerly you could build two and then on the third year you had to go in or they would purge your points rumor has it from fish and wildlife and parks in montana that this year they're going to cut it back to where on the second year you have to go in or they're going to purge your points the bottom line is you have to see montana in your in your windshield and understand when you want to tag because you need to have as many of the preference points as you can in order to guarantee yourself an opportunity at a tag. But if you get too many built up too quickly and you don't go into the draw, they all get canceled and wiped away. And that's only for non-residents. There's no preference points for residents in Montana. Correct. Man, I love Montana as a point. All right. Draw any system. others we want to try to handle in here? I'm, we're game to keep going. You got anything for us, Dylan? Nope, completely up to you guys. If there's more more up on your guys' screen, we can uh, take a few more up and, and wrap it up. There's still quite a few folks on. So, um, yeah, if there's a couple up on your screen, let's do a few more. You want to take that one, Jared? Sure. Yeah, we appreciate that question. I see. How can I upgrade my Hunt and Fool membership uh, with the discounted rate? So, we do offer Onyx members a 15% discount to upgrade from again you have a complimentary digital membership that goes hand in hand with your elite account with onyx uh which by the way we just finished a, a single sign-on project together that makes it so seamless to launch your hunt and fool membership from your elite platform uh and there's also a current elk hunt giveaway that's going through march 15th i should mention that we've got 402 participants still on here uh, you should all be in that elk draw. It costs you nothing to enter other than being an Onyx Elite member, which you already are, and making sure that you activate your Hunt and Fool, your complimentary Hunt and Fool digital membership, and then uh, walk through some very simple steps on our website to enter that elk hunt for two in Montana that Onyx has been good enough to put put on the plate for you guys. Uh, having said that, if you want to be able to call up and talk to Robert or Garth or any of our other hunt advisors, again we have nine different people that take calls. Uh, not all of them are like, we have a core group of hunt advisors that take the majority of those calls, but the rest of us specialize in our own way, shape or form in other areas. Uh, if you wanna do that, we have one-on-one -on -one memberships and we also have an all access membership. The one-on-one -on -one is a uh, hundred dollars a year. It does not include a print copy of the magazine, uh, but you can upgrade and activate it with a 15% discount uh, to get that as an Onyx member. And then also the, the all access is $150 a year. It's the magazine, it's hunt consult consultations, it's all of the tools we've been talking about this entire time. And you can also get a 15% discount on that one. And it's, I know this can kind of be drinking from a fire hose a little bit because there's so much That's not coming. possible. <laughs> <laughs> Analogies. But the one thing that we really do specialize in, and I will say this, if it, if it seems a little bit overwhelming, the one, the one call that I seem to be taking more often, and I love these calls, 
but people that are just getting into it from the start and don't have a lot of experience and need to build and build an app strategy customized towards them. Everything that we talked about today, we'll go through that on the phone and find out what type of experience you want, what game species you really want to target, what weapons you hunt with. And we can come up with a pretty good app strategy going forward to get you on a hunt that's kind of customized to your own wants and needs. Which that excellent point, which does segue over. We do have a cost calculator on our website. It's a proprietary tool that no other company has ever put forward. It allows you to go in, create a little small profile, just like a first and last name and an email, I believe. And then you can go in and window shop all these states and species. And as you click like, hey, I want to try Idaho moose and I want to try Colorado deer and elk, it'll actually have a running total of the uh, what your cost would be to do that. So it's a super effective tool for trying to figure out your budget. Um, but then, like I said, a lot of times our best success, if you want to upgrade your membership to a one-on-one -on -one or an all-access, is to actually use that first or in conjunction with your first consultation so that you can do some window shopping first and kind of dial your budget in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then on our website, the research tab is where you're going to find most of these tools, EMAG, draw odds, etc. Also, um, to add on there, it's really helpful how you guys have the state's individual information. So on, I believe it's the research tab, if I'm not mistaken, but where you can select the state and it will show you, it gives you connections to the state uh, website and just all the literature that you need. But also it breaks down each individual, like whether it's points or whether, you know, it, it's preference points or what, whatever that state is. Um, super helpful information. And I mean, I have, I've got just a pile of these on my desk, every, every issue of those. And, you know, instead of picking up the phone and calling Robert or Garth or any of you folks, a lot of times I'll just skim through that, that particular section. The one thing I always tell people is it's not your standard hunting magazine. Like, you know, we've all, we've all been to a gas station and we needed something to read for the next couple hours on a road trip and picked one up. You know, this, it does, like, it does have really cool hunt um, articles throughout, but the, the information is a lot of, you know, what we just talked about and broken out by state. So super helpful information there. Um, do you guys have any more key ones? The other thing I will note, and I confirm this, is if we don't get to your question, we can um, and will take those questions down and can respond later. So if we missed your question, um, you know, we, we can get back to you after this recording, uh, get shut off. So that is, uh, good to know. We will take one more here for sure. You want that one or you want me sure, to? Sure. Yeah. I'll take it. So it says you touched on the Montana deer elk combo preference point cap. And to clarify that topic a little more, would you lose your combo preference points and not your limited entry bonus points? So they're two separate draws, like Jared talked about with the preference points for the combo. If you don't apply in a certain time frame, you will lose those points. On the limited entry points, you never lose those points unless you draw your first choice. So even if you quit applying for five years and start applying again, until you draw that limited entry tag that you put as your first choice, you will never lose those points. If you draw the big game combo, the deer combo, the elk combo, you will lose your preference points, but unless you drew the limited entry, you are never gonna lose those. So your limited entry points are safe until you finally you know, draw those. And again, with a lot of the changes going this year, there's some great units that archery that we used to have a lot of guys applying for. We're taking one to four points to draw and there's rumors that they could be, you know, essentially first choice unlimited, or if you did put in for that, you would lose your points. But if it is a first choice unlimited, a trick is when you go to apply, it's going to ask you, would you like to participate in the bonus point system on a low drop down? If it's in the first choice unlimited, you know, you're going to get it. So check no. And then if you have four or five points, it's going to save those. So you can keep doing that unlimited first choice, not using your points. And then say sometime you want to go after a different tag that may be limited, then click the box. Yes, I want to use those points. Can you still build a point that year? You to... cannot. That's what I thought. Yeah, if you apply in the draw and you check the box, no, you cannot build a point, but you'll stay, say you're at four, you'll stay you'll at four, those. you know, forever. Instead of burning those four on a tag that's guaranteed, just check the box that says no. I actually have one more um, and we can just touch on it briefly, but we had a few questions come in about hunting elk east of the Rockies. So Kentucky, Pennsylvania, do you guys have any insight on um, 
that super high level question that I'm sure we could spend another 45 minutes talking about, but um, any info on those states? I think of them as a raffle. Yeah. I mean, they're what, 10 bucks for Kentucky. Kentucky. And, uh, really? you know, I think it's, you know, around a little bit more for Pennsylvania. Mm. You can apply in the archery draw. You can apply in the, in the rifle draw. Honestly, Pennsylvania has some of the biggest bulls in the world. I mean, they've got multiple bulls over 400 that are harvested. Um, the odds of drawing Pennsylvania are kind of like drawing a sheep tag. Hate to say it, but that's the truth. When you go to Kentucky, I mean, they've got 11,000 elk that live in Kentucky right now. Um, that herd is doing great, but they issue a lot of tags. So you mm. don't see the quality. I mean, you know, it's, it, it's an area where I'd say you're going to be hunting, you know, 300 to 330 bulls is what Kentucky's kind of turned into. Uh, but that's your best draw chance of drawing if you're there. There's multiple other states that have elk populations, but they are resident only to apply. So if you live in those states, you kind of know about those and you'll be applying there. Um, Kentucky, they've been using this transplant stock to a lot of those other states. Um, but, you know, honestly, when it comes down to it, think of it as a raffle, even for the residents, the draws are so tough. I mean, you know, you just throw your 10 bucks in there and think of it as a state raffle, um, do archery, do rifle, you know, some of them have a youth. I mean, there's multiple different ones, but super easy to apply, you know, five minutes online and you're done. Super you don't easy. have to pick a unit. And even really. Pennsylvania, they have points, but those points aren't going to get you anywhere. No, no. no. Kentucky's random. Kentucky's random. But the points aren't going to get you anywhere. It's just like having sheet points. <laughs> Based yeah. on the slide we showed yeah. earlier. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah. If you live in those states, raffle, take advantage though. of it. That's, cheap. that's the thing with the raffle too though is somebody has to win and as robert right. did earlier you know your kids won one and you know we all know that that one person who should not have drawn that particular tag that they drew because they only had one point or you know their first year drawing i mean heck i drew i drew montana's now it was a little bit easier at the time but i drew montana's most difficult deer tag and probably one of the top five elk tags my first two years of hunting montana you know, age 12 and 13. Now I wish I could go back and have the eggs back now. Um, I would do things obviously a little bit differently, but you know, somebody has got to draw. So that is one thing with those raffles is there's always a winner. <laughs> yep. Yeah. You know, and for those East coast guys, don't overlook Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire. You know, those are draw moose tags. Maybe you don't have to come all the way out here. I mean, there's, there's a handful of draws on that side of the world that, you know, a guy should be applying for if he's driving, if not come out West I mean, that's where the land of opportunity is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you do want to upgrade, I, I didn't touch on this earlier, but the best way to do it is probably just to call in and talk to one of our friendly receptionists. We've got, we've got several customer service specialists that uh, pick up the phone uh, and take good care of our customers. So if you want to upgrade, it's 435-865-1020. We can probably link that somewhere down here in the notes, I'm guessing. But yeah, just call the main office number and uh, ask one of them if they can help you out. Awesome. Well, yeah, I mean, I appreciate everybody staying on. We still have, looks like over 300 folks here um, had, you know, most of everybody on for the whole time and lots of really good comments, lots of great questions. And as we said, you know, if we didn't get to your particular question, we'll do our best to um, answer those after the fact, um, you know, just circling all the way back as, as we said in the beginning, all Onyx Elite members have a free access to a Huntful digital membership. So, um, I will actually post a link um, to the website right now or here in just a second in the chat um, how to go about that. And then, Jared, you, you reminded me about our elk hunt giveaway there. So we are doing an elk hunt giveaway with Hunt and Fool. Um, all you have to do is be an Onyx Elite member and then redeem that free digital membership at Hunt and Fool, which is a no-brainer um, to redeem anyways, obviously, and, and it gets you entered for an elk hunt, a rifle elk hunt for this year in Montana for you and a buddy. So um, pretty incredible elk hunt that we're giving away and super easy to enter, especially with that single sign on that we, we implemented this year. All you have to do is sign in with your Onyx credentials. Um, very straightforward. So definitely do that. Um, am I missing anything at all? I know we, ton of information, like you guys said, it, it can feel like drinking out of a fire hose, but um the nice thing is we will post this um, to our YouTube, to On Excellence YouTube, and we'll we'll also uh, send an email letting folks know about it. So uh, you can re-inform yourself, re go through it, which will be uh, super helpful. We do have a couple more webinars coming up with Hunt and Full Team. 
uh, that may or may not be elite exclusive. So diving into a little bit more specific, you know, in-depth units and, and that knowledge that obviously you guys have behind your paid memberships. Um, so be on the lookout for those. And then um, also we had a few folks in the comments who really wanted to do an Onyx Hunt hat giveaway. We are incredibly low on inventory. And when I mean low, we are out of Onyx hats right now. So we will do our best to restock. And then the next Hunt and Fool uh, webinar that we have with them, we will have some hats and some Onyx gear in stock where we will do some giveaways toward the end. So um, yeah, did I miss anything? Any final notes? I think you guys linked in your, your website. Um, if not, we will now. Um, and then you also included the, the number for upgrading to those different memberships, but anything, final notes, final words. I think no, I just really good. appreciate you guys, your time. And, yeah. you know, like I said, there's lots of information on that digital membership, you know, make a plan, <clears throat> you know, head out West, go hunting. Yeah, no, appreciate everybody's time. I know it's late in the evening, probably where a lot of our participants are, and we just appreciate your time and interest and hope we can help you and get inspired to come out and do some hunting. Awesome. Well, thank you guys. And yeah, stay tuned for a few more webinars with the Hunt and Fool team.